Last week, Academy football was part ecstasy and part agony. For the midshipmen and the Falcons, there were celebrations. For Navy, it was a breakthrough weekend in more ways than one, as excellent special teams execution sparked the first win of the season. Special teams, you know, have been hurting us, but today it helped us. For Air Force, the Falcons flexed their muscle in Albuquerque with another commanding ground attack on offense and stout performance on defense to top New Mexico. I think it's team football when you're able to earn some first downs and defensively being really good on third down. But for Army, it was a different story as the Black Knights ran into a buzzsaw in Ball State and ended up in the Hurt Locker. Just overall, not a very good performance. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sort of disappointed. While at Coast Guard, a competitive back and forth football game goes in favor of Norwich. We had opportunities to win late in the game and we didn't take advantage of it. It was a week of highs. That looked like Navy football. And a week of pain. Well, that was just a good old fashioned buck whipping. What does this week hold? There's only one place to get that answer. This is Behind the Lines, the Academy Football Report. Welcome to this episode of Behind the Lines. I'm Graham Knight. It was an exciting week of Academy football. That is, if you were a Navy, Air Force, or even a Coast Guard fan. But for Army, maybe not so much. We'll get to Air Force, Army, and Coast Guard in a minute, but we start with Navy. The midshipmen did something last week they haven't done since last year. They won. Navy's 34-30 victory over the University of Central Florida is a triumph that's been a long time in the making and was preceded by eight straight losses. Here's Diane Roberts. And Graham, they were 16-point underdogs to this Knights team. They rallied for 17 unanswered points in the fourth quarter to win this game. We had to start at the end for the first Navy win in almost a year. They deserved some time to relish it. We needed that so bad. We just needed that so bad. Healed up quarterback Ty Lavatai got his first complete game of the season and first points on the board with a first quarter rushing touchdown. He ran in another in the fourth. During the 0-3 start, head coach Ken Niamatololo said they needed someone to earn the job under center in order for the offense to get some consistency. It was a big win, but I thought Ty gets me here in the job today. For the first time in a long time, the much maligned Navy offense was clicking, racking up 406 total yards, 348 on the ground, and going five for five in the red zone. Coach Jasper made a point of we had to score over 30 points, we had to get over 300 yards rushing if we wanted to win, and we did both those things, so it was just great to see it all happen. And that would be demoted offensive coordinator Ivan Jasper, whose primary focus now is coaching up the quarterbacks. After being a liability in the first three games, the special teams unit went to the top of what Coach Niamatololo called his crisis list. The extra emphasis paid off. Navy blocked an extra point in the first quarter. And then defensive back Michael McMorris blocked a punt in the second. Watching film and everything, they lined up, and it's exactly what I saw on film. I was like, wow, I'm about to go do this. And then I did it. <laughs> and Daniel Taylor did the rest, recovering the ball in the end zone for the score. If we didn't get that block punt, if we didn't you know, win the special teams, we, we probably don't win. The game wasn't without issues. The Middies had eight penalties for 72 yards, including a late hit by co-captain Diego Fago that led to points for the Knights just before halftime. Navy entered the game with the fewest penalties and penalty yards in college football. I was proud of Chance and Diego too. They made some big mistakes, but they came back with two, some huge plays, man. So just credit to their you know, character. They both said, my bad, and they came back and made plays. Fago caused a UCF fumble that gave Navy the ball, and the Middies completed the comeback with an Isaac Ruas touchdown with 3.09 left in the game. But the victory wasn't final until a Taylor Robinson interception in the end zone with 24 seconds left to seal the deal for Navy. Next up for Navy, SMU, another conference game in this tough schedule, Saturday, October 9th, and the midshipmen hope to keep the momentum going. Graham? Navy's win over UCF breaks the Knights' hat trick, and they're the last team in the conference Navy had not beaten. 
And now to Air Force. A dominating performance on both sides of the ball earned the Falcons their first conference win, topping New Mexico 38 to 10. The sneak by Hazeek Daniels and he's in for an Air Force touchdown. The Falcons defense started off strong, holding the Lobos to a three and out on the game's first drive, and then turning it over to Hazeek Daniels and the Air Force ground game. The Falcons ate up eight minutes and 24 seconds in a 73-yard, 10-play drive, all on the ground, capped off by a Daniels one-yard run to make it 7-0 Air Force, and the Falcons never looked back. The Falcons scored on all of their first four possessions of the first half to take a 24-zip lead, tallying up nearly 200 yards rushing by halftime. Meanwhile, the Falcons defense held New Mexico to just 46 total yards in the first half and forced two Lobos turnovers. One of those by 6'1", 210-pound senior Vince Sanford, who finished the day with eight tackles, three and a half sacks, and forced the fumble. Vince has played three different positions for us. Just as savvy, his football awareness. Golly, just some guys just have a knack for being able to play the game and being able to process no matter what you do and still cut loose and play. Vince absolutely does. On offense, Brad Roberts was the bell cow with a career-high 29 carries for 142 yards rushing and two scores. The Falcons ran for 408 yards on the ground and continue to top the FBS in rushing. We have so many weapons on offense. There's so many weapons we have that help us out, so that's awesome to have. It was the second straight year that Roberts had a 100-yard-plus game against New Mexico. In just nine games as an Air Force Falcon, Roberts has eclipsed the 1,000-yard mark rushing, and his coach is impressed. His work ethic, his consistency, his attention to detail, also how much fire he has in, in terms of pulling for Omar and pulling for Emmanuel Michel, because all three of those guys are contributors for us. Next up for the Falcons, the undefeated Wyoming Cowboys in a key Mountain West Mountain Division clash in Colorado Springs. It'll be the first conference game of the season for the Cowboys. The Falcons are one and one in conference play. And now to Army. After starting the season 4-0, Army hit the road, and they were a 10-point favorite going into the game against Ball State. But that all changed with the opening kickoff. Aaron Summers explains. The Army 28-16 loss to Ball State broke a seven-game regular season win streak that dated back to November 2020. The Black Knights were never really in the game, and head coach Jeff Munkin was not pleased. That was just a good old-fashioned butt whipping, and uh, not much else to say other than that. It was Army's roughest start yet, with Ball State returning the opening kickoff for a touchdown. The, the kickoff return for a touchdown to start the game, that just, that, that's, there's just no excuse for it. Just didn't make a play. That was the whole story of the game. We didn't make plays. And to make things worse, the Cardinals scored on their next two possessions to lead 21-0 before the game was 10 minutes old. The 21-point deficit, the largest Army had faced all season. With quarterback Christian Anderson sidelined due to injury, Tiger Tyler got the starting nod, leading Army to two straight scores in the second quarter. The two TDs, both rushes by Tyler, brought the score to 21-14 Ball State at halftime. With them getting up uh, by that margin, that did uh, come as somewhat of a shock. Um, but as we got into the game, uh, more serious, we got the, uh, the ability to kind of settle into what we do and what we do best, and I think our execution got a lot better. Neither team scored in the third quarter, and Munkin opted to replace Tyler with Jamel Jones. Jones had limited success, and the Cardinals were able to break through again in the fourth quarter, scoring a touchdown three plays after a Jones interception. We gotta run the ball, we gotta run it effectively, we gotta be able to do it against whatever we see, and if people are gonna cheat that many guys to the, to the run, then we gotta be able to throw a play action pass. We weren't able to do either one. The Black Knights have a lot of time to think about this loss, with the bye week before a Big Ten matchup at Camp Randall against Wisconsin. They're mad and, and disappointed, and, and hopefully we'll take it as a lesson and, and prepare and, and get better. We're certainly going to need to, to play better. This is certainly the, the most talented and, uh, and biggest uh, athletic team that we've faced 
so far this year. And uh, to beat Wisconsin is going to take a, an absolutely tremendous effort. If things won't get easier after Wisconsin, the Black Knights will host undefeated Wake Forest and then have a CIC contest against Air Force on November 6th in Arlington, Texas. Graham? Thanks, Aaron. And just a reminder, Behind the Lines will be in Arlington, Texas to cover the Air Force Army matchup. So be sure to catch all of our shows or follow us on social media to keep up with all the action. And now to Coast Guard. The Bears started conference play hoping to bounce back from a heartbreaking loss to Anna Maria. And Coach C.C. Grant said to expect a physical game against Norwich in the annual Mug matchup, the 75th time these two teams have met. The cadets were physical, forcing three Coast Guard turnovers, holding the ball for nearly 40 minutes, and running 93 offensive plays in a 24-21 win over the Bears. The defense just kept hanging in and hanging in and hanging in. To be able to play 90 plays as we did under those circumstances and still only give up 24 points, and it got a defensive score. The teams combined for eight punts in the first half, but an 80-yard pick six by freshman linebacker Ethan Lasher gave the Bears a 7-3 lead at half. It was the first of two on the day for Lasher. Early in the second half, it was a big play seesaw affair. Norwich scoring on the first play of the second half on a 78-yard TD to take a 10-7 lead. Then Jared Coletti burst through for an 84-yard touchdown on the next offensive drive to give the Bears the lead again 14-10. Norwich would score twice more while the Bears could only muster one more scoring drive, capped off by a Tafari Wall TD run. In fact, after a Coast Guard three and out in the fourth, Norwich held the ball for the final six minutes and two seconds to secure the win. We didn't take advantage offensively of some of the field positions that we had during that ball game. So we had opportunities to win late in the game, and we didn't take advantage of it. Coletti ended the day with 195 yards rushing on 20 carries, but the rest of the offense was pretty anemic, gaining only 119 additional yards. Next up for the Bears, conference foe Springfield, who stand at 2-3 and three on the season. All right, Academy football fans, you're not going to want to go anywhere because when Behind the Lines returns, we'll introduce you to the greatest defensive player to ever play at Navy. And a little later on, Diane Roberts sits down with Mr. Triple Option himself, Paul Johnson. Don't go anywhere. Behind the Lines will be right back right after this. Welcome back to Behind the Lines. During Saturday's win against the University of Central Florida, the U.S. Naval Academy retired the number of Chet Moeller. He was selected a unanimous All-American and was elected to the College Football Hall of Fame in 2010. Behind the Lines correspondent Diane Roberts was at the ceremony and caught up with the man considered to be the best defensive player to ever come out of the Navy's program. On a gorgeous day in Annapolis, Maryland, former Navy football player Chet Moeller got to bask in the glow of love and appreciation for the talent he forged on the Navy gridiron. Obviously, it's very exciting and it's uh, very rewarding. I'm thankful my uh, teammates were out there and my family was standing beside me. Uh, very gratifying. Navy retired Moeller's number 48 during the first quarter against UCF, only the fifth midshipman to have that honor. The 1976 grad registered 275 tackles during his Navy career, including a school record 25 for a loss as a junior. The former safety is said to have revolutionized the position. Coach Belichick and Pete Carroll talked about using his cut-up tape of him coming off the edge. I got to see that video. I mean, he, he was amazing. He epitomized the, the phrase, practice as you play. He practiced harder than anybody, and he played harder than anybody. Teammates like Ed Gilmore and family like son Trey beamed with pride. Hearing about how well and highly they speak of him and how big of an impact he had on the team and what a good player he was, it just makes me feel so proud. Super happy for my dad. When you hear that you are the best defensive player to ever come out of Navy, how does that make you feel? It doesn't really register because I can't imagine somebody saying that to me. But I mean, it, it's very exciting. A lot of stories were told today about things I did that I don't remember. One of the stories he does remember, and so do his teammates, is when Navy ruined the University of Pittsburgh homecoming in 1975. That's when Chet stuffed future Hall of Famer Tony Dorsett, saving a touchdown. 
Tony Dorsett had uh, run a sweep and stuck his foot in the ground at, at 45 degree and Chet chasing that. He was, he was unbelievable. Pittsburgh was driving, got down to the three. We stopped him four times. Last time was we pushed Tony Dorsett out of bounds and that was so gratifying. Players told Trey about the time his dad punished Syracuse signal callers. He knocked out the first quarterback and then the backup quarterback came in. He knocked out that quarterback. So they brought in a tight end to play and the tight end was lead, having to lead Syracuse. They were playing with their third string quarterback. His dad was taking all the QBs out. And lest you think he was just a beast on the field, when Moeller was a senior, he won academic honors too. He served four years as an officer in the Marines after graduation. Moeller was captain his senior year, and he joins a distinguished group of players who've had their numbers retired. Quarterbacks Roger Staubach, number 12, and Keenan Reynolds, number 19. Halfback Joe Bellino, number 27, and number 30 running back Napoleon McCollum. When Behind the Lines returns, we'll have the first part in a series of deep dives into the nitty gritty of option football with a man considered to be a mastermind of the triple option, Coach Paul Johnson. Stay with us, we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Behind the Lines. I'm Graham Knight. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, the Behind the Lines team will be doing a deep dive into the history and techniques of option football, something often referred to as a ballet. The Academy Football Report had the good fortune to catch up with former Navy head coach Paul Johnson. Diane Roberts starts off our series of conversations with Coach Johnson, and her interview was a reunion of sorts between coach and reporter. Here's Diane. My first year, in Washington, D.C., covering sports and covering Navy, you were the head coach. So wow. it's nice to see you again. We both have been around a little bit. For people who don't know, Coach, can you tell us what the triple option offense is? Well, the triple option is actually one play, but uh, it's designed that it has any of three ball carriers can have the ball, and it's uh, based after the snap off reads. Uh, there's an initial read. You leave two guys unblocked. Uh, one to play the dive and one to take the quarterback. And then you have uh, numbers that, that, and angles that hopefully can outnumber the defense if you can do the thing right and read the thing right on the way out. So the guy doesn't take the fullback or the B back. You hand him the ball. If he does, then the quarterback goes to the second option. If the guy takes him, he pitches. If he doesn't, then he runs the ball. And there can be variations. There's all kinds of variations off it, and you can change the blocking schemes. But uh, it's basically just one play in the offense. Why is it effective for service academies? Because service academies, they can't compete with the Alabamas and the Floridas and the Georgias. Right. They have to be different. Is that why the triple option works for them? The, you know, the thing about the academies, the recruiting is different. And uh, the one thing I learned after leaving Navy and going to Georgia Tech, you know, in typical year at Navy, we probably signed 70 or 80 guys uh, counting direct in the prep school. And at those other schools, you're limited. Probably the most we ever signed at Tech in a year was 24. So you might not be getting the, the guys that are, you know, graded as high by the recruiting sites or whatever, but you're also getting a lot of uh, guys in that 80 that are diamonds in the rough that they missed on. So it gives you a chance to be competitive. Who introduced you to the triple option? Well, a long time ago, we actually ran the stuff when I was in high school. Uh, playing. We we're a wishbone team. And then when I started coaching, I went back, when I got out of college, I went back to my high school and was fortunate enough to be the offensive coordinator right back out of college. And then after that, I went to a junior college and got away from it. Uh, we were more a high formation team back then. Uh, I left there and went to Georgia Southern as a defensive coach. It was, and then uh, we were a combination kind of run and shoot a uh, little bit of option at Georgia Southern while I was coaching defense. And when I moved over to the offensive side of the ball, we just kind of evolved into what we, you know, we did pretty much my whole career. I think the academies, because it's hard to find the fast receivers and the guys that, uh, that can do that, you don't maybe throw it as much. Uh, Georgia Southern, we could do whatever we wanted. We had some really good teams and uh, we went 62 and 10 while we were there. And, uh, so we didn't throw it as much because we were usually ahead in the games and, and didn't have to. But uh, 
you know, over my whole career, somebody did a, a study a few years ago and uh, through about 30 some years of doing it, we had averaged about 34, 35 points a game and well over 400 yards. So it had been successful pretty much everywhere we coached. Hopefully there's enough people that still understand it and know how to, how to do it, that it'll be around. But, you know, football goes in circles. Uh, what was popular once goes away that people, you know, f- think they figured out a way to play it. And then all of a sudden it comes back in a different form or whatever. So uh, I think it'll be around for, for a long, long time. Option football for sure. Next week when we continue our conversation with Coach Johnson, we'll discuss his coaching tree, a tree that includes Coach Ken Niamatololo, Coach Jasper, and Coach Jeff Munkin. Behind the Lines will be right back after this. Welcome back to Behind the Lines. I'm Graham Knight. That's just about going to do it for this show, but that doesn't mean our coverage of Academy football is ending. Please pay us a visit at BehindTheLinesTV.com or catch us on YouTube at Behind the Lines, the Academy Football Report. We're working hard to cover Academy football 24-7, and you can find lots of extras on our YouTube channel, including raw, uncut interviews, and you can find lots of extras on our website as well, including game notes from all the games. So if you didn't get a chance to catch the game, you can catch a recap right here on our website. As we close out this show, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Navy Federal Credit Union. They make Academy football happen. They're making this show happen, and they're also making it happen for Navy. I happened to be at the game last Saturday, and I caught this shot, and I want to share it with you as we close out the show. This show wouldn't be possible without Navy Federal, so as we close out, just want to say a warm, heartfelt thank you to Navy Federal Credit Union for making the Academy Football Report possible. Thanks. We'll see you next week.